This is the Build Wealth Canada show, episode number 84. Welcome to the Build Wealth Canada podcast, where it's all about becoming debt-free, accelerating your wealth, and taking control of your money. Now, here's your host, Cornell Schreiber. Hey, it's Cornell, and welcome to the Build Wealth Canada show. Many listeners of the show, myself included, are total market index investors, where we just buy ETFs that are meant to represent the entire market as a whole worldwide, as opposed to stock picking or trying to speculate what will go up or down and investing based on that. Now, after you've been investing for a while, it's easy to begin to wonder whether you should customize your portfolio a bit further so that it's more aligned with your particular situation or so that it holds a bit more of the types of companies that you want in your portfolio. Now, when you start looking into this, you'll quickly come across what is known as factor investing, which can be used to tweak your portfolio so that it holds more companies that contain specific attributes that you like. Now, typically, an investor wouldn't just ditch their total market index portfolio and replace it completely with factor ETFs. But what some choose to do is keep their indexing portfolio as their core, but then allocate a portion of it towards certain factor ETFs. Now, in this interview, we talk about the benefits of doing this so that you can better decide for yourself whether it's worth the added complexity in your portfolio. We talk about the risks that you need to be aware of if you partake in modifying your investment portfolio in this way. And we also cover how you can analyze factor ETFs to find out which, if any, are the right fit for you. And of course, we cover some of the different types of factor ETFs out there, what they mean so that you can better decide about potentially incorporating them into your own portfolio. Now, to help me with this, I'm excited to have Danielle Naziol on the show, who is the vice president of the largest Canadian-owned ETF provider in Canada, which is BMO ETFs. Now, Danielle has an entire research team backing her up, researching and creating ETFs for Canadian DIY investors. And as the largest Canadian ETF provider, it's exciting to be able to pick her brain and hear right from the source about this type of ETF investing. Now, you're going to hear about different free tools and resources on the episode. So to make things a bit easier for you to access, I created a page where you can access all of them, and that's over at buildwealthcanada.ca slash BMO. So just buildwealthcanada.ca slash BMO. And that's it. Enjoy the episode. And now let's get into the interview with Danielle. All right, Danielle, welcome to the show. Thanks. It's so great to be here, Cornell. I'm so excited to be here again. Yeah, great to chat with you. It was really fun having you at the Kenyan Financial Summit. So thanks again for for being part of that. It was uh, very educational, your presentation. So uh, thank you so much. Oh, yeah, that was awesome. And it's great to talk to your audience. We know they have a lot of good questions and they're really plugged into this. So I love it. For sure. Yeah, one of the questions that I think has sort of recently come up for a lot of Canadian investors is what's happening in the market. So we are going to talk about factor investing ETFs a lot in this episode, but maybe before we jump into that, uh, we've actually had the market start to decline a fair bit. Uh, today, as we're taping this, it is January the 21st. Um, so we're actually you know, seeing some negatives there. Maybe some investors are getting nervous. Maybe some investors are trying to wrap their heads around you know, what actually is going on. Should I be concerned? Can you maybe speak to that, what you're seeing on your end, just to kind of help us maybe get a little bit of understanding as to what's happening? Yes, yeah, sure. So I think um, you're definitely right. We're seeing a little bit of volatility pick back up here in January. And you know, I think this is just a direct reflection of some macro things that are going on in the market, right? So we're seeing inflation hit really, really high numbers. I know in Canada, we just saw the numbers 4.8%. Um, in the US, they're even higher than that. We're getting indication that the Fed and the Bank of Canada want to start raising interest rates. So when interest rates go up, this has a really uh, direct effect, especially on growth stocks. So we're seeing growthier stocks, um, indexes like the NASDAQ that are more exposed to growth sectors like IT. Um, they're kind of being impacted by this. So I, I don't think we're, we're not surprised by the volatility right now. It's not something like COVID that hit us um, out of the blue. Uh, and, and, you know, Cornell, we were just talking before the show, uh, investors should remember, if you just look back 12 months ago, so the S&P 500 uh, returned, I think, oh, just over 27% last year. So the, the, the small pullbacks we're seeing, and I'm calling them small relative to what we saw in March 2020, but the pullbacks we're seeing now, I think, are a reflection of, of some macro events and uh, the market sort of digesting these headlines. Mm-hmm, for sure. Yeah, what I keep telling myself is, Cornell, what did you think was going to happen? I mean, you're, you're seeing these crazy strong returns 
for so long now, right? I mean, obviously, you know, we had that COVID crash, but then even that recovered so quickly, relatively speaking, you know, we're not going to be seeing constant, you know, double digit growth and just expecting that without any sort of, you know, drops in the meantime. So I think it's sort of good to get that little reality check where, okay, it can't all be uh, butterflies and unicorns or whatever. Exactly. Markets go so just straight up. They're not at certain, you ever looked at a stock chart? What stock chart goes straight up? So, exactly. Uh, yeah, so I think uh, for now it looks like the market is digesting a few uh, a few headlines and 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 it should shake out. But you're right, the last few years have we have seen some pretty extraordinary returns. So I think it would be very hard to to repeat those double digit returns. But we'll see. Mm-hmm, for sure, um, and I mean, yeah, those people that did stay invested in the market during that COVID crash, I mean, you know, they they have done quite well, right? So it is. Um, it, it, the staying invested has paid off for a lot of people for sure. Absolutely. So yeah, the great advice for you to give to your audience is, you know, stay invested, uh, you know, let volatility or don't let volatility spook you too much. And if volatility is something that spooks you, and this might be a good transition to our topic today, there are, uh, ways you can get less volatility from ETFs in your portfolio, but we're going to get into that shortly. Sounds good. Yeah. So let, let's dive into factor investing. A lot of the listeners of the show are total market index investors where we just buy the market as a whole using the same core ETFs. What is the advantage of now also adding factor ETFs into our portfolio? Yes. So broad market uh, index ETFs, they give exposure, like you said, to broad market returns. It's pretty easy. Call them plain vanilla ETFs. Um, and for some investors, you know, Cornell, this, this might be all they need or all they want in their portfolio. Um, But when we start talking about factor ETFs, so factor ETFs are designed to target certain areas of the broad market. uh, And the goal is actually to provide better risk adjusted returns over the long time. And I think one of the key things is risk adjusted returns, because remember, when we're thinking about our portfolios, we're managing not only returns, but we're managing risk as well. Um, and what risk and return profiles best for each investor is different. Um, So factor ETFs, they give investors an opportunity to kind of add above market returns. And so we call this alpha, so returns beyond the broad market. And factor ETFs are, they're not as simple as broad market ETFs, but they're not overly complicated. And we'll talk about them today. And there's lots of resources out there to educate investors on them. But I think uh, for investors looking to add factors to their portfolio, they should be, you know, listening to our podcast today is great. And and just doing a little more due diligence because there's a little more to learn and to know about them before uh, just throwing them into their asset mix. And you mentioned risk adjusted returns, just so that people can get a good understanding of the definitions. If someone says, oh, I want the highest returns possible versus, okay, I want the highest risk adjusted returns possible. You know, how, how are those two different? What should we know? Yeah. So investors are generally compensated for taking risk. So usually the, the riskier stocks have uh, more potential for higher returns, but they also have more potential uh, for more, more losses. And um, so an investor needs to decide for themselves, how much risk can I take on uh, to generate a certain amount of return? So for an investor that doesn't want to take on too much risk, they should have the expectation to match certain returns that an investor with a higher risk tolerance or risk profile uh, has taken on. So just something good, good to think about as investors are navigating their own portfolios is is you know you want to manage how much risk you have in a portfolio just as much as you want to manage your returns and that's where you know ETFs become such a great tool because they're so diversified you're already minimizing like something like a stock specific risk where you're only holding one stock mm-hmm. would risk adjusted returns apply well to asset allocation ETFs as well where by looking at that you're basically to not run into this problem where someone might say, oh, well, this one asset allocation ETFs clearly outperformed this other one. So I should just go with that because its numbers are, seem higher for the last year or five years or whatever the case may be. But then you look at, okay, well, what's the stock to bond mix of each of those? And if one's an all equity, you know, 100 um, asset allocation ETF versus the other one is like a conservative one or like a 60 40, then obviously you're going to get different returns. Does that apply in that situation as well? Yeah, exactly. It's a great example. So someone who can take an all 
booty position. Maybe that's somebody with a very long time horizon that can that can ride out bumps in the road like we're seeing now in the markets. An all equity portfolio, if you look back over time, will always outperform over the long term the portfolio that has a fixed income allocation. And it just goes back to that risk adjusted return, but that all equity portfolio is taking on a lot more risk um, than the fixed income portfolio. So if you look back to March 2020, perfect example, the fixed income portfolio would have outperformed in the short term then. Mm -hmm. So just always something to think about and consider when when looking at returns. For sure. Yeah. What well, one ETF or, or group of ETFs, I guess, that come to mind when it comes to this is, for example, you were talking offline earlier about one of the BMO ETFs, uh, ZESG, which is an asset allocation ETF, but it's on the social, one of the socially responsible investing ETFs and how if, if we're comparing, well, how did that one do relative to the market? How we have to be really careful to make sure that we're comparing it to another asset allocation ETF that has the same stock to bond mix, right? So I believe that one is 60-40. So we would mm -hmm. want to compare it to something like, you know, Zcon. Is, is that how you guys pronounce it at BMO? Zcon? Zcon, yeah. Zcon yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sounds good. Yeah. So we, we would want to compare that one's performance to Zcon because that one is also 60-40 as opposed to something like Zgrow, which I believe is 80-20. Uh, is that right, Danielle? Yeah. Zgrow is 80-20. Zbal is 60-40. Equities are the 60%. 40 is the... Um, the fixed income. So ZESG is a balanced portfolio, 60% equities, 40% fixed income. Um, so you can compare it on, from the high level asset allocation mix. But when you're comparing ETFs, also consider, um, you know, one is an ESG ETF and one is just a broad market approach. So there's differences there. You want to look under the hood. Are they holding a similar global regional asset mix. Something else we talked about this morning was um, ZESG doesn't have a, a, any emerging markets exposure right now, whereas ZBAL does. And emerging markets had um, had a rough go in, in 2021. So uh, things like that will also deviate from the performances. So as, as investors go down the road and want to research more ETFs, just you look under the hood, see what it's holding, see the sector the regional exposures, the differences in strategies, these all play a part in um, different risk profiles and different return profiles. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I definitely think it's a point worth bringing up because I've definitely heard some horror stories of key investors, uh, someone trying to trick them to, to sell them certain investments and saying, hey, look, I can. why are you holding this investment that returned this amount when I can sell you this other one that has earned you know, 5% higher versus the one you're showing me. And it's like, well, hold on, hold on. <laughs> what is the actual stock to bond mix of the one I had versus the one, um, you know, that you're proposing, right? Because if you're a 60, 40 type of investor and someone's saying, Hey, look, and if equities had a really good year and they're comparing it to a hundred percent equity, you know, portfolio, that's not an apples apple to apples comparison. And yeah, the returns might look higher, but maybe you're not willing to handle that uh, to, to stomach that volatility, right? So I think that's a really good lesson for a lot of investors, especially when someone's trying to persuade you to to buy something, right? Or if you're getting jealous of your neighbor's returns that they're, that they, that they're bragging about at the Christmas party, it's like, well, may, maybe they have a higher equity allocation and equities had a really good year that year. So we can't just kind of jump to conclusions too quickly, right? Yeah, totally. Like great example is uh, a friend of mine was telling me, oh, I've made so much money off this energy stock. I bought it in market crash. And I looked at the returns and I'm and I said, you know what? It actually matches very closely an energy ETF. Only oh, yeah. you put you put on so much more risk by going in a single stock versus a diversified basket. And and you're really excited about the returns, but actually a broad, a broad energy sector ETF was matching those returns the entire time with less, less volatility and less risk. So yeah, just a good thing to look at. For sure, for sure. Yeah, I, I've definitely heard heard examples like that before as well. Yeah, where people are are so happy about the return, it's like ah, but you took on so much risk, and you could have just bought the the ETF and been actually nicely diversified. Um, so yeah, for sure, it's always good to have that uh, frame of comparison. Hey there, just want to give you a quick announcement that I'll be hosting the Canadian Financial Summit again this year, and I have free tickets for you. So the conference is 100% online, so no travel required. It's specifically for Canadians. It's taking place in the fall, and my co-host and I are bringing on some of Canada's top personal finance experts to share their best practices to help you retire early, invest better, lower your fees, pay less on taxes, and help you learn the best practices when it comes to personal finance and investing so that you can hit your financial 
presidential independence number years earlier. Now, collectively, past guests of the summit have been in hundreds of media articles from major news and financial publications in Canada, such as the Globe and Mail, Financial Post, Global News, CTV, Yahoo Finance, and many, many more. So I'm giving away free tickets to the entire event. So to get them, when I release them, just sign up anywhere for free over at buildwealthcanada.ca. And that way, I have your email to send them to you when they're ready. And also, as a bonus, when you sign up, I'll send you my PDF guide on the top personal finance and investing tools that I use specifically for Canadians. It's all free, and all you have to do is sign up anywhere over at Build wealthcanada.ca so I know where to send you the tickets. All right. I look forward to seeing you there. And now back to the show. What are the risks of incorporating factor ETFs into our portfolio versus just sticking with total market index investing? Yeah. So I think, and we you know just talked about risk a little bit there, but I think it's good to define what is risk. So one way of looking at risk is a term we call beta. So the overall market, we say that it has a beta of one, and then anything with a beta higher than one is deemed riskier than the market. Um, And anything with a beta lower than one is deemed less risky than the market. So for investors who are um, with just, you know, plain vanilla, broad market core portfolio, they're probably tracking around a beta of one. Um, And then so these riskier high beta stocks, they have more potential for growth. Uh, than the less risky stocks. But like we said, then there's also more potential for losses as well. So when an investor is thinking about adding a factor ETF to their portfolio, they're going to be altering that risk return profile. So maybe they're starting with something close to one, and then depending what factor they're adding, they're going to be altering that um, altering that profile. So each factor has a different risk and return profile. And an example, and I know we're going to get into the different factors in a little bit, but the value factor historically uh, has higher beta than, than other factors, higher, higher beta than the broad market. But then historically, if we look back, you know, 20, 25 years, it's also outperformed the broad market and other factors. So investors being compensated for taking on that, that added risk uh, worked out if we look back over, you know, 25 years. If you look at the other end of the spectrum, low volatility stocks, just kind of how the name suggests, Um, they have less volatility, less beta than the broad market. So if we look back again on that 25 year, you know, there was a graph I sent you earlier, Cornell, I don't know if you'll be able to share it with your audience, but if you look back on that risk return graph, the low volatility actually did provide a little outperformance to the broad market, but with much, much less risk taking on. So I think as investors go down the, the path of the about adding factor ETFs to their portfolio, they should consider uh, that risk return payoff. And that will definitely alter the broad market core that they've set up for themselves. Mm -hmm. Would you say that this is maybe especially important now because we are in a low interest rate environment? A lot of people are kind of getting nervous about bonds because we see inflation being high. You know, bonds are not returning what they once were. And so I imagine there are many investors who are like, all right, I'm a little concerned about bonds, but I I don't want to just go all equities either, just broad market, you know, equities either, because the volatility on that's going to be pretty large. Um, So maybe I can augment my portfolio in a way with where I'm still holding equities, but, you know, I'm focusing on specific factors to maybe not make it as volatile. I'm thinking especially maybe for the retired investors or someone that, you know, maybe just doesn't want to handle that, those, you know, those, those really wild swings. Would you say that's especially the factor investing is maybe more relevant now than maybe in the past as well for that reason? I think the factor investing, we've talked about this, um, is, is, is really good for, or can be used to more tactically, So you can react, especially using ETFs, because they're such uh, efficient tools to add and sell it to your port from your portfolio. But you can kind of tactically use them to tilt your portfolio to a certain factor. So if we're thinking about today's environment for someone who might want less volatility, they could tilt their portfolio to the low volatility factor by adding a low volatility ETF. Now, these are still equity portfolios, so they're not fixed income portfolio. So just because it's low volatility doesn't mean it's a bond replacement tool. I think I I need to be clear about that. But for investors that that are are comfortable with, with perhaps adding more equities to their portfolio, but thinking about wanting to keep the risk dialed down, 
the low volatility factor uh, would work in that scenario. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you can't just put it into a low um, volatility factor ETF and be like, oh, this is going to behave like a high interest savings account. Like, oh, hold on, hold on, slow down. (laughs) Not apples to apples here. (laughs) But if you compare it to the S&P 500 or uh, the broad Canadian market, you'll see that over the long term, it has a smoother stock chart than something with more volatility that kind of bops up and down. Mm-hmm. And we're using low volatility as an example, but I guess you could also augment it to swing the other way where, okay, I'm maybe very okay with even more volatility than the more total market um, because I would like to hopefully get, you know, basically I'm looking for higher expected returns. So you mentioned value being one of the factors. Are there other ones that we should keep on our radar if that is of more interest to us, other factors? Yeah, so what we're seeing now kind of play out is we're calling it a rotation into value. And so because of those those rising interest rates that are putting pressure on growth stocks, we're actually seeing um, a lot of investor interest in in value. And value was actually out of favor um, for the last few years. And if we look back historically, value has done, done its best coming out of market lows or out of market crashes. And uh, just to just to kind of let your audience know who's not who isn't familiar with value investing, uh, the value factor is looking at stocks with um, lower valuations relative to their peers. So they're screened for things such as low price to earnings ratio and low price to book uh, ratio. So we're seeing now uh, value really kind of take off again, and and it's starting to outperform the broad market. It's outperforming other factors. So some investors want to hop on on this train and they're thinking, I would like some value exposure. And so they can think about looking at ETFs to do so by adding, again, like a satellite position to their core holdings. Mm-hmm. Does BMO have other factory ETFs that look at value, but look at other factors too, like profitability and things like that? Yeah, so we do. Okay, so we have a suite of value ETFs um, and we have a suite of low volatility ETFs. We covered that. Something like profitability, we call these... Um, quality, quality factor. And with quality, we're looking at uh, the strength of a company's balance sheet, how sustainable are its cash flows? Does it have lower debt on its balance sheet and lower debt to equity than its peers? Um, These are the kind of metrics we look at with the quality factor. And the quality factor actually had a pretty good run um, over the last few years, up until this this market kind of pullback, and a lot of that is because we're finding these quality companies uh, in the tech sector and a lot of the growth the growth space because they've uh, you know like Apple, Amazon, Microsoft these these companies have that have been around for a long time and matured and uh, our manage, management teams are very strong so. Uh, these are these are kind of o- overweighted sector in the quality in the quality space. But now that, that we're seeing those growth stocks pull back, we're seeing some quality, the quality factor pull back as well. Gotcha. And there's a lot of factor ETFs out there. How do we begin to analyze them as DIY investors to find out which, if any, are the right fit for us? Yeah, I think the first step for an investor is just to determine well what factor is best suited for for me me. And I think just to try to research every single factor ETF would be would be too much. So I think you might want to just target in on a single factor and, and do your research, high level research on what is each factor and what can each factor provide and how it can can alter a, a portfolio. And then you can start diving into uh, the offerings available in Canadian listed ETFs. But um, I think investors can just do some good old fashioned online Google research when they're looking at the types of factors available. You can look at the different um, ETF providers and you can see which factor ETFs they offer. BMO, we have um, we have a lot of ETFs. So we actually have a great document, the BMO ETF roadmap. It's right on our website, BMO ET, or BMO.com slash ETFs. And an investor can go through each region of the globe and find what, um, what factor ETFs we have for each region. So that's kind of how we sort it out on... Um, on our website. And then if you look up a, an ETF ticker, each provider should provide, you know, the strategy, how are they, how are they capturing that, that factor? They may provide white papers on the methodology. 
Um, and so there are usually our supporting documents on the provider's websites. You know, BMO, we have them on all on our website. All our factory ETFs have a white paper that's right on the product page. And, and you mentioned quality, uh, the, the quality factor, the value factor. Are those based on a certain index that an index provider provides, like you know, like the you know SMPs of the world, the MSCIs of the world, or is that something that BMO basically crafts themselves, looking at all these different things, like you mentioned, and qual- when you look at quality, you're looking at a whole bunch of different factors uh, within that. Yeah, that's a great question. So at BMO, we actually do both approaches. So we have our suite of factor ETFs. So we have um, quality, value, low volatility, and high dividend, which is also a, a factor. And we've, we've actually split, split how we're doing it. So we've decided to partner up with an index firm. They're called MSCI. And we use their indexes for our quality ETFs. And we use their indexes for our value ETFs. And we call them enhanced value. Um, and that has worked really well for us. We did a lot of due diligence. We have a strong partnership with MSCI. And we see them as, as a leader in the factor index space. So that is how we chose to design those products. And then for the low volatility factor, our low volatility ETFs and our high dividend ETFs, they're actually managed uh, by our ETF portfolio team or the, the rules and the methodologies created by our ETF portfolio managers in-house. And that's simply because we have uh, the, the expertise and the resources. We had a lot of experienced portfolio managers who had worked in these factors before. So we were able to develop um, our own methodology to support those ETFs. So even though uh, some of them are index-based and some of them are non-index, the non-index ones, we still say they're rules-based. So they're very disciplined approach. They're dispassionate. We uh, we follow the rules very, we don't just willy-nilly add or subtract a stock based on a gut feeling. We're really, really um, focused on, on that methodology and that those rules. Gotcha. And are there any educational resources that you can recommend? You mentioned the, the the site already. Is everything on there or are there other places you'd recommend listeners go to if they want to learn more about the factors and how they're calculated, how they've performed in the past, that kind of thing? Yeah. So if you'd like to learn about BMO's suite of ETS and how we manage each factor and our strategy behind it, how we're capturing those stocks, uh, if you just plug in the, the tickers, you can find the tickers on our ETF roadmap and then just type the ticker in on our, on our website. If you just scroll down to the bottom of the product page, there's some supporting documents there. And I probably direct um, direct people to the white papers because that's where we really dive into the exact strategy, how we're screening for these stocks. Um, and we'll get, we get very detailed. So it, they're great, great, uh, great papers to read. And if you're just doing some research on factors in general and you're just trying to get you know, your feet wet and understand the differences, MSCI has a fantastic uh, website dedicated to uh, factor investing. They have so many articles and they have a lot of historical performance as well. That's something investors want to look at how factors have performed, um, you know, over the decades. So that's that they don't have a, a nice clean URL, but if you just Google MSCI factor indexes, it'll come up and I find that a great resource. Awesome. You know what I'll do, Danielle, as well is I'll, in the show notes for this episode, like we'll have a custom page for it. I'll add the resources and the URLs that you mentioned, and then that way listeners can just hop on. Um, so if anybody, everybody listening, if you just go to the main site, which is buildwealthcanada.ca, um, it's going to be on the front page this episode as soon as it comes out, and it's going to be on the front page for probably six months or so um, before it goes into the archives. So definitely you can just find our, find Danielle and my picture there <laughs> on the front page, click on that episode, and I'll make sure I include all those resources uh, that Danielle's talking about so that you can learn more about it. Or just do the Google searches like Danielle's saying, but this way we can kind of have one spot where everything is there and you can learn more about it um, if you'd like. I, I've def- I've read uh, quite a few of the BMO white papers and the different resources they have. It's it's really, really well done, really high quality, um, very educational just to learn more about this this world of factor investing and whether you should incorporate it into your portfolio or not. So um, yeah, I'll be, I'll be more than happy to link out to that. It's been, it, I, I found a very, very educational reading for sure. That's great. Yeah. It's so important for investors to do, do your due diligence, you know, know what you're adding to your portfolio before you, before you actually invest your hard-earned money. Awesome. And um, would you consider factor investing to be active investing as opposed to passive investing? Yeah. So historically factor investing was an active, an active way of management and investors at home. We had no access to it unless we 
you know, maybe had to find a high fee fund or high fee product where, uh, you know, there was an active manager behind it. But the beauty of ETFs is that now, um, Cornell, you and I and everyone at home can add factor, a factor strategy to their portfolios. I think that's really cool. Um, and then, like I kind of mentioned prior, so there are kind of two types of factor ETFs. You have your index and your non-index, but again, they're both they're both a rules-based approach. Just the non-index means it's a strategy in-house, and then an index means um, we're partnering or the firm is partnering with an index provider to use their expertise and their methodology. Gotcha. So is the big difference then that comparing factor investing versus sort of the what people view as active investing is that with passive, like you mentioned, rule-based, I imagine that's a really big difference between sort of a traditional active mutual fund versus uh, an, uh, a factor ETF, let's say, right? Because I imagine the factor ETFs are very much rule-based or they're following an index, which is also rule-based, right? As opposed yes. to there just being some fund managers that are just kind of uh, doing things in a much, I guess, less structured way, I would think, where they, you know, where it's not as rules based, and they're just trying to make the good shots and trying to beat the market that way. Is my understanding of it correct, or, or should I think of it yes. differently? Yes, exactly. And I think you know, an active manager, they are more proprietary as to how they're running their strategy, so they won't be as transparent. They're not going to publish a white paper uh, on on their website and tell everyone how they're picking their stocks right? right they don't want to share share that and they're also probably uh not sorry to cut you off they're also probably not going to share their entire portfolio holdings with you again this comes back to the the beauty of an etf where you can look up every single holding in the etf at any given time an active manager probably doesn't want to share that with you so uh, yeah and an active manager can deviate usually most of them have have a process they stand by but they're less constrained and with an and with an ETF, whether it's index or not, you generally still have your your constraints, your your rules you've set for the index uh, that govern it, and that go- or for the ETF that govern it, and uh, you kind of sit by that pretty strictly. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. Yeah, that, that sounds like a really key key difference, I think, for for Canadian investors to to know. But it's not like you're giving them some you know some hot shot advice. Um, you know, analyst, a whole bunch of your money and Hey, do with it as you will, because I trust that you're going to do well. It's not that at all. It's more kind of, and then they obviously want to keep it all secret because it's like their special sauce or whatever you want to call it. Their exactly. special way of analyzing and they don't want to disclose any of that because then they lose their competitive advantage and then they'll have fund outflows, that kind of thing. Whereas with factor investing, for example, like in this case, and with indexes, it's actually rule-based and fully transparent. You can actually go in there and you can see all the holdings and all of that. Um, so you have a very different uh, cup of tea, I think. So, so definitely it sounds like we should never really merge it with sort of that traditional definition of active investing because it sounds like those two are actually very very different in terms of how how they're set up and how they're run yeah exactly i mean and any etf that doesn't track an index is is called an active strategy but keep in mind like it's it, it is run very different than a traditional active fund manager who's who's doing kind of their own thing we still set set those rules and we stick by them Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that, that's a good point. It's it's not like there's only one type of active. There's 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 layers. It sounds like exactly. Gotcha. Um, so when I spoke with your team in the past, it was mentioned that BMO believes that it's most optimum to have both a passive and active to have both passive and active investments within our portfolio. And interestingly, when I interviewed Vanguard in the past, they also had the same viewpoint. So I wonder if that's a common viewpoint among the major ETF providers. Can you share why you think? our investment portfolio should have an active component as opposed to just being 100% passive through total market index ETF. Right. Okay. So I think what we're, what we're, we're, we're parsing through here, Cornell, is, <laughs> is you have, you have your, your core portfolio and, I, and a lot of your listeners uh, do this. They use, you know, I, I say plain vanilla ETFs, your broad market ETFs in your core portfolio. Um, so what's the benefit of adding something else? What's the benefit of adding a satellite position? Um, to that portfolio. And it comes back to um, kind of trying to see if you can generate more returns than just what the the core is giving you. So can you generate returns beyond the broad market? And then investors can can do this in in many different ways. They can seek out a factor ETF. They can seek out a sector ETF. Um, There's different 
there's different ways to do it, but that is kind of the reasoning behind considering adding something to complement your core instead of just having a core. But for some, the core portfolio, you know, just a few broad market ETFs that works for them. And they're, they're very happy to match broad market returns and other investors, you know, they might want to do their research and see what's going on in the market. You know, how can I tactic, tactically tilt a portfolio to take advantage of some short-term uh, market, you know, scenarios. Gotcha. Thanks for answering my question. I didn't, <laughs> I was stumbling on my words there a bit. So I appreciate you oh, I got <laughs> still it. making totally sense of it. <laughs> I followed you the whole time. <laughs> so when ETFs get launched, they don't have a long history where we can, for example, stress test them by seeing how they performed during, let's say, the 2008 financial crisis or the tech crash in the 2000s. If you want to see or simulate how that relatively new ETF would have performed in adverse market conditions, how would we go about doing that? Okay, so there's a few there's a few things I I would. Um... I would I could tell you that you can look at. So if an ETF does track an index, that index might have a longer history than the ETF does. So a lot of index providers, um, they have indexes and they, they've published them, but there's not an ETF tracking it yet. So you can always research the index, the index of the ETF tracks to see how it's done. And, um, you know, index providers, S&P, MSCI, they all have have fact sheets online that you can look up. So that's kind of one way of, of doing some due diligence. Uh, another way to think about it, if you want to look at the risk rating of an ETF. So this is usually published on the ETF's website, can also be found in the ETF's prospectus. Um, and what this kind of tells you is the, the um, how volatile the ETF has been over the last 10 years. So it just gives you an indication of the measure of risk. And this is governed... Um, you know, by the OSC, you can't just rate your ETF anything you want. So even if the ETF is less than 10 years old, um, the ETF provider actually has to find an index that that very, very closely matches the, the strategy of that ETF. And you look back, you know, you backfill the 10 years. So that that risk rating can give you some indication of how it how it's done in terms of risk over the last 10 years. Um, and then, you know, lastly, you can do some research high level if you're looking at factors. And I think MSCI actually is a really good resource for, for this. But you can read about how factors have performed over the long term. And of course, it's not going to be exact to the, the ETF strategy, um, you know, down to that pre precise. But you can at least get, in, get in a, a vibe for how the factors have, have done. And you know, when we look back historically, in times of when markets have crashed, or in down markets, low volatility tends to outperform because of the lower beta uh, profile. We've seen historically that coming out of a market crash, like we're seeing now, or we saw in 2009, value has generally outperformed. So there are some trends that pick up and you can do some research on that, but I think that's a, a good way of just getting an indication how a factor will do over the long term. Gotcha. And for anybody that wants to do some research and see what index a particular ETF that they're considering is tracking, where would we go? Uh, what, where should we go online to figure that out? So the ETFs per, um, index has to be published in its prospectus, uh, but a prospectus is sometimes uh, it's a big legal document, and investors don't want to look through that. So most um, ETF providers' websites will put rate on the product product page of that ETF, it'll say usually in the strategy, um, what, what e uh, index it's tracking. And in fact, some of them even have the index right in the name of the ETF. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then you basically grab that index and you could just plug that into Google, for example, yes. uh, like let's say it's MSCI or something like that. And then that will come up. And then there you could check to see, okay, what's been the historical performance on that particular index. So the ETF that you're considering might only be a year old. Like I'm thinking of one of your ETFs, like uh, ZESG, um, which is your asset allocation. The one we talked about already, the asset allocation ETF, that's also uh, for, social re for socially responsible investing, right? So that one, um, you know, had a really good year last year, uh, but, you know, but it's only been out for like a bit over a year. So if someone wants to know, okay, well, how could I see how it would have performed a bit longer than that, I guess that would be the right approach is look that up, see what index it tracks, and then Google that index and then see if there's some information on there. Would that be the right process? Yeah, 
that could be that could be helpful. And I know if we're using that as an example, so you look and the, the holdings are actually a few different ESG ETFs, um, which all track the MSCI ESG leaders indexes. So you can look up MSCI ESG leaders index, the Canada one or the US one. And there's probably a fact sheet online. I think these indexes have 10 years of, I think they published them 10 years ago. So you can go back and you can see, and usually the index providers are pretty, pretty yes, thorough. They'll give you not just performance numbers, but things like sharp ratios or volatility metrics, risk metrics. So you can, you can get some good, um, good information on the index, which will then translate to the ETF that attracts. Mm-hmm. That, that's a great point, Daniel. Yeah, I, I'm glad you mentioned that. So I guess to clarify for the listeners, there are some ETFs where you can look it up and they just directly track a specific index like the S&P 500. Um, but then there's other ones like the one we're talking about right now, ZESG, where it's an asset allocation ETF. So it's actually an ETF that consists of other ETFs. It's like a basket of ETFs. And so while ZESG doesn't have, and correct me if I'm wrong, Daniel, while ZESG doesn't have uh, index that attracts per se, like one to one. What it does is it holds other ETFs um, that basically because because you're trying to get like some bond exposure because you, you, it's an asset allocation ETF. So you're trying to have like a you know one kind of one ETF for your entire portfolio. So then you actually want to look up the individual ETFs that ZESG holds, for example, see what indexes those track, and then there you can get some good history that way. Did I? Explain that, okay? I don't know if I did. <laughs> Explain it perfectly. Okay. I couldn't have done it better myself. So, <laughs> right, an asset allocation ETF doesn't track an index, but it holds a bunch of ETFs that all track an index. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. Um, yeah, so I, I think that's a good, that, that's a really good tip um, for people when you're doing your research because you may come in, you, you might start looking on the sheet and say, I can't see anywhere where it says what index it tracks. But then if you go into the holdings tab and you see what it holds, that you'll probably in there, especially, and this is, I guess, especially true with asset allocation ETFs. You'll see all the different ETFs that are holds, and then you can look up each one of those. Um, that's great. Okay, so thank you. <laughs> I thought we'd clarify that because I could see someone looking it up and like I can't see the index, I can't find it, and it's well, it's because you have to look at the individual holdings, not just at the broad level for some of them. Um, Correct. Makes sense. Um, how is using factor ETFs different from just using active ETFs or mutual funds? We talked about this a little bit, but maybe if you have something to add. Yeah. So, um, yes, yeah, so usually an active mutual fund, so it doesn't track an index, right? There's that, that active manager that's, that's calling the shots. Um, and then that the, the, uh, from the mutual fund perspective versus the ETF perspective, you know, when you use an ETF, you can buy and sell intraday anytime on the exchange. Uh, they're very, very cost efficient. The transparency is such a big benefit, especially when you get into things like factors, because you want to know exactly how is that ETF capturing um, capturing that factor, what screens is it using? How is it selecting stocks? An active manager won't tell you that. An active manager won't tell you the holdings, um, whereas the ETF will. So, so all those benefits uh, that we talk about all the time about using ETFs, it kind of translates straight through to using factor ETFs as well. And would it be fair to say that we can start with a broad total market ETF approach by just buying the core ETFs to start, but then we can use factor ETFs to fine tune our portfolio for our specific need to either increase potential returns at the cost of risk or volatility, or to reduce volatility or risk at the expense of lower expected returns. Yeah, that's that's a good way of looking at it, especially as investors get started with adding um, factor factory ETFs and doing their research on them. So we, I call it like a core satellite approach. And I don't know if, you know, if you already have your core set up, you can maybe consider adding like a small, a small slice to a factor ETF to tilt it in a certain, in a certain way to capture certain characteristics, whether that's you want low volatility, or you want those quality companies, or you prefer high dividend, or you like the, the value story. Those are, those ETFs are all available to add. Gotcha. And are there things that we should consider other than just looking at returns and volatility? Those seem to be sort of the two big trade-offs that we've been talking about up till now. Is there something else that we should be looking at too? Yeah, there are a few actually. I'm glad you're asking this question. So um, you want to look at things such as its sector breakdown. So once you start moving outside of the broad market and into a factor ETF, you're going to see a much different sector makeup. Um, than the broad market. 
A great example is in the low volatility space. So in Canada, um, and a lot at Halbima, we kind of organize our, our factory ETS by region. So in Canada, the broad market is very heavy in um, energy and materials. If you look, if you just screen out the lowest volatility stocks from the broad can Canadian market, you're going to get a portfolio that lo looks a lot different. It's going to be more weighted to defensive stocks like utilities uh, and the consumer stocks. So all of a sudden you have a portfolio with you know, very, very little energy weight, uh, and then overweight those other sectors. So that's something to keep in mind, especially, and then if you look at low volatility in, in the, um, in the U S there's much less tech exposure, almost none. So last year, the U S low volatility strategies were really underperforming the broad market. And that's just simply because of that lack of tech weight. Now we can look at after January, I'm sure you will see low volatility U S strategies, outperform the broad market. Uh, and that makes sense if we think about that sector breakdown. And then there's obviously regional differences, like kind of how I mentioned um, in between each different factor, it kind of looks a little differently. For example, the quality factor in the US is uh, overweight to tech companies. But if we look at the quality factor in Europe, we're looking more now at an overweight to healthcare and consumer stocks. So I think a really good tool investors can use, we actually have a compare tool on our ETF website um, and you can plug in five different ETFs and you can, you can look at how do the sectors look differently and kind of get a different breakdown and compare the ETFs to get an idea, um, you know, look at that ETF under the hood and get an idea what it, what it really looks like. Gotcha. So I guess the process would be, okay, you figure out which factor you want to maybe tilt a little bit towards, but then you would use that tool. And again, I can link out to it on the on the page here. Um, you can then use that tool to make sure, okay, when it comes to sectors now, am I still nicely diversified or have I chosen things in such a way where, yes, I'm tilted towards certain factors, but now I'm way overrepresented in energy or, or whatever sectors. And so now I've actually got some reduced, I guess, diversification, or I'm putting a little bit, maybe too many eggs in one basket because I'm so concentrated in a particular industry or a, whole, or a whole group of industries. Did I understand that correctly? Yeah, but I think it works the opposite way. So if you look at the broad market, you're so if, if you're investing in broad market Canada and a lot of investors, we have that home bias, we're overweight Canada, you might be taking on actually more risk than you realize because the broad Canadian market is very cyclical because of those heavy weights to energy and materials. So by tilting your portfolio to um, a low vol, so by adding a little bit of a low vol strategy to that, all of a sudden, you're kind of diversifying away from um, the higher beta sector. Oh, like, okay. and, and, and you can look at that, you know, it depends, but it depends what you're adding. So if you look at uh, the broad U.S. market and you add a quality ETF, the sector exposures are actually quite similar within the region. So maybe you're not going to get as much diversification. But if you were to add a low vol ETF, from a sector perspective, then all of a sudden you're getting more sector diversification because um, the underrepresented sectors in the broad U.S. market are are weighted more heavy or he more yeah heavier in the low vol. Approach. Gotcha. Oh, okay, that, that that makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah, I think especially for Canadians with that whole home country bias and how how much we hold, <laughs> uh, sure. how many Canadian equities we hold typically. Um, that's yeah, that's very very interesting. In one of the BMO white papers I read, it was mentioned how one strategy is to go into and out of factors depending on the economic climate. So, for example, if we're seeing slowing versus rising growth or increasing versus decreasing inflation. However, most listeners of the show, I think myself included, you know, prefer the more sort of set it and forget it approach where we don't have to follow the economy too closely or the different economic markers or the markets. So instead, I think we would rather just kind of have the same ETFs to buy every month with a piece of every paycheck and, and just hold on to those long term until retirement. So for those types of investors like myself who are kind of more on the passive front, should they just do total market index investing or can factors still be a smart tool to use without having to analyze you know, what economic climate we're in or doing any sort of speculation? 
Yes, that's a really good question, Cornell. So we do talk a lot about how factors can be used in a more rotational strategy by adding and, and, and taking them out and replacing as different times in the, um, the economic cycle. But some factors can actually be more of a buy and hold. And again, this all comes down to um, the, the, the exact investor and what their goals are. So if an investor is focused on income, well, a high dividend ETF, which is a factor, that might be something that works for them because they're looking for that added income over the long term, and that works well for them. Um, low volatility for some investors that can't stomach the volatility uh, or maybe have a shorter time horizon, might, might it might work for them to have a buy and hold on, on a low volatility. Utility ETF, and I was actually looking at the performance of um, BMO's low volatility Canada ETF ZLV, and over the long term, it has it has handily outperformed the Canadian broad market, which is um, pretty impressive to see, considering it is taking on so much less risk. And a lot of that is because it's avoiding the energy sector, which is so cyclical and, and can boom and bust. So it really depends on the investor, but we're seeing the benefits of factors also as the, the long-term um, risk-adjusted returns. Uh, like that graph, I hope you post that visual in, in the notes because sure. it's, it's the annualized return and annualized risk. And you can it's a really good visual to see over 25 years that the longer you can hold the factor ETFs, they've actually outperformed broad, the broad market over these long terms. Awesome. And, and yeah, for sure. I'll, I'll post that in the show notes as well. Uh, can we go through, we, we talked about this a little bit, but can we go through each of the different factor types and explain what they are? Sure. So I'll do a quick, a quick crash course. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds good. In under two minutes. Okay. Um, so, so quality. So we're looking at high quality companies relative to the their peers. So we're screening for things like low debt to equity, sustainable cash flows, really strong balance sheets. Uh, and like I kind of mentioned before in the US, we're really seeing this in the IT sector. So these ETFs are, are right now overweight to that sector. Uh, in Europe, we're seeing quality companies come out of those consumer names and those healthcare names. Uh, low volatility, less volatile than the broad market. Each firm kind of runs their strategy differently. At BMO, we look at a five-year beta. So we look at the beta of a company over the last five years. As you're kind of researching different strategies, I think it's it's a good thing to look at um, the metrics that companies are pulling to screen these stocks because we believe that five year, looking back five years on, on the beta number is, is more important than looking back on like a one-year beta number that can move quite quickly. So some just some considerations to make as you're, you're kind of studying these strategies. So uh, again, low vol, I think it's pretty self-explanatory, but in Canada, we are seeing um, the low vol strategy is a very low weight to energy or maybe even a zero weight to energy. Um, high, so high dividend, uh, this is a factor. So these are, again, it's it's in in the name, it's companies who have higher dividends than their peers. But not only are, you know, at BMO, I can speak to our approach, not to how other firms are doing it, but we're not only just looking for the highest dividends uh, and then just taking those stocks and, and calling it a day. We actually have a way more uh, structured and detailed approach because we want to not only look for companies who are paying high dividends, but companies who can sustain those high dividends. So that means that they need to have strong cash flows as well. And companies who are growing their dividends over time. So these are some screens that we look at at BMO when pulling together the dividend ETFs. And then another really common one we talked about is value. So this is this one really resonates with investors who think valuations had have been too high or they're looking for you know, those lower valued um, companies that uh, might kind of outperform over time. So you're looking at ratios like low PEs, low PEs. Uh, so generally companies with more attractive valuations than peers. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. That's great. Thank you. And yeah, we'll, uh, I'll post that because you have a nice um, chart that you sent me with a, because of a description of each one and some example ETFs that we can actually look up and see. So I'll, I'll be sure to include that as well uh, in the show notes. Uh, again, for everybody listening, you, you can just go to buildwealthcanada.ca. It's going to be there on the front page. Just scroll down to see the most recent episodes and you can click on there and I'll be sure to uh, to link out to that. So um, so that's awesome. Uh, Danielle, where can we learn more other than the page I just mentioned? Uh, if, you, if someone wants to go and check you guys out directly and all the different free resources you have, where can we go to learn more about factor investing? 
podcasting, uh, get some of, use some of your free tools and white papers and that kind of thing. Sure. So uh, I'll direct you to two places. So BMO, um, dot com slash ETF. So this is where you can get all our product pages on every single ETF ticker and be sure to check, check out our ETF roadmaps. It's a really nice visual of all the ETFs we offer and it's kind of broken down uh, for, under regions. Uh, and then secondly, we recently launched a site we're really excited about. It's directly for at-home investors. It's awesome. etfmarketinsights.com. We have a lot of um, interesting articles, podcasts, uh, and we have a weekly webinar as well. So be sure to check that out. Awesome. And if somebody has any questions about, let's say one of the, the I mean, I, I assume you guys can't talk about competing ETFs, but if someone has a question, let's say about a BMO ETF that they're considering, what's the best course of action to get an answer on that? If you go to etfmarketinsights.com, we have a spot for questions. We usually answer them um, in our webinar, in our live webinars. But if, if anyone wants to send a question and just let me know you're uh, listening to this podcast, I'll just, I'll answer you directly. Awesome. That's great. Well, thanks so much for doing that. And uh, that's, that's awesome. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge. And yeah, I'll link out to all those resources and, uh, and thanks. And I look forward to seeing you again. This is a lot of fun. Thanks so much, Bruno. Awesome. Thanks, Danielle. Bye. Take care. All right. I hope you enjoyed the episode. We're going to have some more interviews with Danielle in the future to talk about asset allocation ETFs, socially responsible investing, and how to think about sectors when it comes to do-it-yourself ETF investing. Now, Danielle and her team were kind enough to put together a list of a lot of great free resources for us on DIY investing in ETFs here in Canada. So what I did is create a page where you can access all of them, and that's over at buildwealthcanada.ca slash BMO. So just buildwealthcanada.ca slash BMO. It's all education focused, no affiliate links or sales pitches or anything like that. Just really good, solid information and tools to help you with your ETF investing. So enjoy and talk to you soon. Thanks for listening to the Build Wealth Canada podcast at www.buildwealthcanada.ca.